Welcome to Shades of Change, The Other Side of Flores. I'm your host, Mark Richardson. Flores Elementary School has a long history of serving the Flores community by providing a good education to its students. This year, the school is celebrating its 125-year anniversary. What a lot of you may not know is that for many of these years, there were actually two separate schools for Flores students due to the segregation policies of Fairfax County Public Schools. Today, we are going to learn more about the history of these schools in the Flores community and take a closer look at the life of the Flores Colored School during the early part of the 20th century. It was typical of schools in Fairfax County during that time period and very, very different from today's schools. With me today to talk about this is Phyllis Coates O'Neill, a 1935 graduate of the Flores Colored School and the parent of one of the first African-American students integrated into the Flores White School. Joe Carpenter, a 1948 graduate of the Flores Colored School, and Yvonne Johnson, the historian at Frying Pan Park, which is located near the present Flores School. Thank you all for joining me today. It is important to note that most of our questions for today's program were written by fourth, fifth, and sixth graders at the present Flores Elementary School. Later in the program, we will have the chance to hear directly from some of the students. Yvonne, you've done a lot of history research on the school. Please give us a brief history of the Flores community and school during those times. Well, one of the reasons that Frying Pan got involved in this is some of the older buildings that were the Flores School are located on park property. Um, and we started with trying to learn about the school system in general. Now, the school system, Fairfax County Public Schools, was started in 1870, and that was only five years after the Civil War ended. The uh, school system now has 230 schools, but when it first started, they started with only 40 schools, and all those were one-room schoolhouses except for one, which had two rooms, very different than the school system we think of today. Of those 40 schools, 13 of them were for the colored students or the African-American students, and it was more than just Fairfax County policy, it was the state policy that the colored students and the white students attend separate schools. The school system managed both sets of schools and they had the same school administrators. Now the earliest record I found of a Flores school is the 1876 deed for the land for the first Flores white school. Now that was located on uh, West Ox Road near the intersection of Centerville Road. The earliest reference we found for the colored school was on an 1878 map. That school was located at the corner of what is now Frying Pan Road and Centerville Road. Um, we don't know when the school opened, but that was the earliest reference we could find for that school. The Flores White School, the very first building was a log structure, and that was replaced in the year 1900 with a two-room frame structure. Now, that building served all the elementary grades. In 1908, some of the students went home, got some scrap lumber, and actually constructed a small shack that they covered with tar paper. And this was what the uh, kids used for a high school building. In 1911, they put up a four-room brick building, and that's the building that still stands today on Frying Pan Park. Now, the four-room building, two of those rooms could be used for elementary school, and two of them were used for the high school classes. But you could only do two years of high school there. If a student wanted to go to high school for four years, they had to go live in Washington. There was no four-year high school in the area. In 1920, there was a uh, three-story building built right next to the brick building. And that building did finally house a full four-year high school. It was an agricultural, vocational, technical high school and they took the upper floors, but the middle floor was used for the elementary grades, which at that time were only one through seven. During the same time period, we really couldn't find much information on the colored school. We did find reference in the newspaper that in 1925, the school was severely overcrowded, and the school district was looking into renting a building in the neighborhood to try to relieve that overcrowding. Then in the early 1930s, a gentleman named uh, Julian Rosenwald actually donated the money to build a larger building for the colored students. They built a two-room structure that was put on the Joe Murphy farm, and that was located at the end of Squirrel Hill Road. There was no colored high school 
in Fairfax County for um, the African-American students. If they wanted to go to high school, they either had to go to Manassas or out to Washington. Now the 1932 two-room colored school building still exists and it's uh, now used as a residence. During the 1930s, the school system had a lot of consolidation. They took their 14 high schools and consolidated them down into seven schools. So the Flores Votech High School was merged with the Herndon High School in 1931. The three-story building stayed where it was and was used as the elementary school all the way up until 1954 when a new modern building was built on Centerville Road. The color schools were also consolidated. In 1953, Flores, Rock Ridge, and Oak Grove elementary schools were all consolidated into a new four-room brick building, um, also named Oak Grove School, and that was located in the town of Herndon, and we believe it was where the uh, Herndon Police Station is now located. The opening of Luther Jackson High School in 1954 was the first opportunity for Fairfax County colored um, African Americans to go to high school in the county. Following the state's desegregation policy in 1964, all students, regardless of race, went to a school that was located near their home, and that started with the 1965 school year. Mrs. O'Neill's second son was one of the first students to be involved with that policy. Now, Flores Elementary School is still located on Centerville Road. It's nearly tripled in size since the original 1954 building. It has over 900 students in the one school now. That's a lot of growth. Um, going back to the colored schools in the early 20th century, um, you, you mentioned some of the funding. How were the schools generally funded in terms of the colored school being built back in, in, the, in that time frame? The school system, it was run as a parallel school system and they were funded through taxes. But both sets of schools also had activities with parents and teachers, fundraising for things that the school needs. Um, they would have bake sales or small luncheons and raise money just like the schools do now. But we also found a lot of evidence where the community came in with relatively large sums of money to help build new schools or improve schools. We saw that Julian Rosenwald came in and paid for all the construction for the 1932 Colored Elementary School. But in other cases, for that four-room brick school, um, almost 25% of the money to build that school was raised by the community. And for the four, for the three-story high school building that was built in 1920, the community came up with $17,000 themselves before the building was actually put up then by the county. So how overall would you say the community was back in the early 20th, 20th century in terms of Flores community? Did it seem to be more together or separated as one may think as because of segregation? Well Fairfax County was a very, the whole county was very rural. We, what, we drive through Fairfax County now and it's a very suburban environment but it was very rural. It was all farms and uh, what we've been able to find is that there were mostly, most of the farmers were white, but there were African-American families that owned farms. How segregated was the Flores community during that period of time? Well, <clears throat> it was segregated, but people were friendly, but they just didn't visit each other. They would speak you know, along the road, they would speak. But uh, it was segregated. We didn't go to school. We didn't have any theaters there. Theater was in Herndon and Manassas, those were the nearest theaters. We would go, but we'd have to sit in the balcony if we wanted to go. How about you, Joe? What were some of the maybe <coughs> experiences that you've gone through in terms of segregation? In well, I can time? remember one in particular. I was just talking about it the other day. Uh, I worked for a Spanish family by the name of Costa. They were from Puerto Rico. And uh, I was out one day with one of the sons from the farm to purchase some things to take back to the farm and we stopped in Chantilly at a drugstore there alongside Route 50 and there was a man there by the name of Dr. Bywaters and his wife Mrs. Bywaters. We stopped there for lunch and uh, when we went in, Sal, the guy that I was with, he told me, so come on sit down, we're going to have lunch and then we go back to the farm. Well when the 
Miss Bywaters came over. She said, I can serve you, but I can't serve him. So he said, well, we're going to leave. We don't want the food if mm -hmm. he can't eat here. That was one thing I remember in particular. And as she said, as Phil said, with the theaters, you have to go upstairs in the theaters. Or there was a log cabin at Chantilly. If you wanted to go in and drink a beer, you had to go into the back door, not in the front door, like we can now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and your parents, did your parents ever talk to you about segregation or maybe some of the expenditures to help they, you along the way? Or? They would just tell us, you're not supposed to go there, so don't go. So we didn't go. And, and that was it, no questions no asked. Question we just well, you, don't, you don't ask questions, you're obedient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ron, did any of your research talk any uh, of the segregation in the community back during the time? Well, it didn't really speak of it. It's what wasn't said that I found so striking was that they would report that this w school got new desks or this school got new this or new that. And none of that ever included the colored schools. Um, they would list all the students that graduated from the white high school, but you know, not the school in Manassas for the colored high school students. So it was more like people just didn't see it or didn't choose to talk about it. It wasn't, it, it would, they were left out. And I found that difficult in my research and I felt like I didn't get to see a piece of history that somebody just edited it out for me and it was taken away from me. The first thing I saw that really struck me was an article in 1945 it was a paid advertisement where somebody actually went in and listed the expenses on what was being spent on the white half of the school system as opposed to what was being spent on the colored half of the school system. And it was very striking, that the, the disparity. It was like four to one. And mm -hmm. there were no new facilities being built for the colored students. And in all our research, that's about the only thing that we found that someone actually spoke out. For our next question, let's go to Flores Elementary School and student Alicia Richardson. Hi, my name is Alicia Rich Richardson and I have a question for Ms. O'Neill. How did you feel about your son going to the first white school? Well, I was a little concerned, but we wanted it to happen. So uh, we, we just sent him, but he got along fine, he didn't have any problems, so he was treated well. So the integration process went pretty smoothly? And yeah, it went smoothly. They, they, well, just two of them. Just two. Mm -hmm. and, and during his years, did, did, were there others that integrated during the time that he went to the school? Or? I think others came in afterwards. I don't know how many. But, uh, and so how did you feel about that integration when it, when it, when it kind of took I place there? Did, did it kind of give you a warm feeling? I mean, how, how, how did you accept the integration? I mean, well, okay, everybody was... See, tried to be real nice, you know. They were extra nice to make sure that everything went along, especially at the school. We didn't have any problems at school. Everything I've read about the integration, that it was just the community accepted that this was the right thing to do and the right time to do it, right. and that it went smoothly. Mm -hmm, they and they didn't have riots, they didn't have protests. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I've read, and mm -hmm. I'm always wondering if that's the whole truth, yeah, it was is that it, it went very smoothly. It did. Yeah. And, and that's against the norm from what you read in history about a lot of the schools across mm -hmm. the country when they integrated. I like to think that we are blessed in this area because we didn't have the problems that they had in other places. Of course, you had your little incidents here and there, but it was nothing really to speak of. But we did know that things were happening, mm -hmm. and everybody accepted it. Yeah, so I, to speak. I think that's a thing to really take our hats off to the Flores community and we see that even today over at the school and, and the care and the concern of all of the parents and, and the teachers. And I kind of see it as a first step because when I first came here from New Jersey and I would go to the bus stop with my children there were so many different nationalities and so many different races represented and my children never saw any difference. There was Don't just me. this friend or that friend and they always got along. Let's go back to Flores for another question. Hello, my name is Stephanie Krogan, and my question is, since you saw some of the worst discrimination in this country during your childhood, and remembering that we just celebrated Martin Luther King's birthday, do you believe we are close to the colorblind society that Dr. King dreamed of? Yes, I believe we are. 
because we can get jobs. All we have to do is be educated. We can get the jobs and we can go anywhere we want to go. And I think we are headed that way. Joe, you have any further comments or thoughts on that, your opinion? Yes, I would like to say that pretty much the same thing she said. The opportunities are there for us now and since we can further our education and schooling. And uh, it's been good. There's been some flare-ups, but it's, it's, overall it's been good. Phyllis, uh, how, how did you get to school back during that time? Well, ma majority of the time we walked. Sometimes the school teacher would um, pick us up and take us, and it was raining and the roads were muddy. Our father would take us in the wagon, horse and wagon, to school. And when you walked, uh, how, how far did you walk? Three miles. We had about three miles. Mm -hmm. Three miles. And was this like gravel road through fields, farm? No, it wasn't in the gravel road then. It was just dirt road. Mm -hmm. and what were some of the experiences you had, like you might encounter while you were walking to school? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, we'd have to watch out for the bulls that were loose in the field. Of course, they were out there with the cows, you know, and they felt frisky, I guess, and they, they could smell us, I guess, or hear us. And they would uh, start down the road. We would squat down and run and run until we got past the farm. Joe, how about yourself? Uh, did you get to school the same way? Or? I walked to school the same way. Uh, what was really rough was wintertime going to school because <clears throat> it'd be cold, snow on the ground. And it was, I didn't have what they call four buckle otics that buckle up to your high up on your leg. My mom used to wrap me at both, both legs and feet with burlap bags and tie it with tar rope string. And believe it or not, it kept your feet from getting wet and it kept your legs and feet warm. Oh, was it hard walking with that? No, no, not in the snow, no. Mm -hmm. It'd be just like walking with a pair of uh, what you see now, the, the people on uh, TV with the sn snowshoes. Snow yeah, same thing. And, and how far did you have to travel? Uh, five miles one way, 10 miles round trip. And how long did that take? It's oh, I don't know, I guess it took over an hour because I walked by myself from the farm out to the main road, that's where I picked up with uh, the Bailey family, the Bailey boys, we walked to school together. Mm. And you had people who came far away as Willard and uh, Chantilly. And you how know. far was those, those folks? Well, away? I would say Willard would probably have been uh, 10 miles one way, that's a 20 mile trip wow, so for, for walking. Two hours to get to school each day. Yeah, and there were a lot of uh, kids at that time that lived in the village of Willard. They walked to school every day. And Yvonne, and how, how strict were the schools in terms of being on time and, or being tardy, knowing that you had to walk so far to get to school? They had to allow for us being late. They did? Because of the weather. And, and uh, uh, sometimes we had smaller children with us that we had to wait for them to speed up and walk, walk to school, you know. So she was very lenient with us. And so many times it was cold, their ears would be frostbitten by the time they got to school. Miss Stewart would would put water on them, cold water on them, try to treat, treat the ears, but they would get frostbitten if the parents didn't cover their ears. Now, how about the white school? The, the students there, did they walk as well, most of them, or how did well, they get to we school? We were so busy taking care of ourselves, I didn't pay much attention to the white school. <laughs> but I think most of them, they had buses, because I know, I remember the buses, I don't remember them walking. Now, did you all like walking to school? Did you prefer wanting to ride, or? Well, what, what could we do? It was a way of living, so we had to do what we had to do. There was no other way. No other way. No other way. Except when our, the teachers picked us up, and, and my parents took us okay. in the and a, way. And again, I'd like to point out, uh, for her it was different, but for me, it was a, just a little bit different. When I got out of graduated from Flores Elementary, as I said before, I rode a bus from Flores to Chantilly to get on another bus to go to Jenny Dean and Manassas. But remember, we were riding what we call in those days second-hand buses because when the white students finished with a new bus, it was handed down. And when you got on that bus, you don't know whether or not you, you have springs jumping up through the seat <laughs> in your backside or whatever, you know. But that's the way it was. And those buses broke down a lot more, too, because well-used, well-used. We had used books. Got very few new books. So that's what we went through. Let's hear from another one of our Florida students. 
Hi, my name is Lavanya Gupta and I wanted to know how many students were in one school. Phyllis, uh, would you care to answer that about how many students were at your school? How many students was yes. oh, between 50 and 60? 50 and 60. Mm -hmm. and, and, and was that to all of the grades so that they have them all together? All, all of them in the same room, one mm -hmm. through seven okay. grades. How about yourself, Joe? The same, <coughs> but the rooms were separated in my school. Mm -hmm. How did the students kind of, how did the teachers kind of handle such you know, disparity in terms of having first, second, third, all the way up through seventh grade in one room? Well, you had respect for your teacher at that time. You better be quiet. You better do your job. Real strict. Yeah, she was mm -hmm. strict. I might, I might point out that, uh, as she said, real strict. But there's one thing. There was a stick in the corner if you didn't obey. So can either one of you give an example where maybe you've got discipline or seen others get disciplined in the school for? Oh yeah, I've been. Mm -hmm. I've had my hands bent back this way and a 12 inch ruler mm -hmm. put on my hands. So uh, if you never had that done, you're missing a treat. Our students at Flores have been asking some excellent questions. This next question is from Ashley. Hi, I'm Ashley Herbayashi and my question is, what sort of things did children in your school learn about? The basics were reading, writing, and arithmetic. And of course, uh, you had your, uh, I forget the name of the paper that we used to get daily. It was a, like a newspaper clipping that we used to get that we would read. But uh, that was the main thing in, in the elementary school, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Geography. Yeah, geography, yeah. And science, civics. You know, so what, what sort of things, like in science, did you learn? Uh, did you get to do experiments and things like that in your science classes? Or? No, I don't remember too much about that, but I know the teacher would come and we'd uh, teach us to uh, do uh, crocheting and embroidery and all that stuff, uh, all those things. How about um, maybe a prayer in the morning? Did you guys have prayer in school? Oh, yeah, we had prayer in the song every morning. Yeah, every prayer, morning. Bible verse and uh, pledge allegiance to the flag. Those are things that you did. Mm -hmm. and then, then we did, uh, made those arts and crafts and we had Fields Day once a year. And, they, and when we uh, would go to Fields Day, we'd have games, spelling bees, and uh, baseball. And what else did we have? We used to go to Bell's Crossroads. What else did we have? Well, there were baseball and games like that. That's about it, I can, mm -hmm. as far as I can remember. And, and, and we read me. about Field Day when we were doing our research, and they said Mr. Woodson, who was director of the mm -hmm. entire school system, he would come and speak mm -hmm. at these. Do you have any memories of that as a kid, or was he just there to talk to the grown-ups? Well, I don't know, because I was the spelling bee, and I was too excited. I was <laughs> waiting for them to have the spelling bee to do it. So how, how were you in the spelling bee? You participated? I won once. Won once? Mm -hmm. Great. On cool. the word Comet, C-O-M-E-T. Yeah, wasn't that something? Okay. How about recess? What sort of things did you do for recess at the school? Well, we, uh, we had three of them. One in the morning, your noontime re recess, and one in the afternoon. And what we'd do in the afternoon, we loved that one in the afternoon because we'd go, uh, you heard uh, Phyllis talk about Bowman's General Store. We used to go down through the woods up to the store if we had some pennies. And there was a man that named Mr. Pace. And we got penny butter logs from him. We bought sodas from him. And this man would all, he loved kids. And he would always see that you got a little extra when you got there. Is that right? Yeah. Now so that's a lot man. different from today because today the students aren't allowed to leave the premises. Mm -hmm. So you were allowed to, to leave off the school grounds on yeah, that we time. Could, uh, yeah, we, we let the teacher know. Mm -hmm. We let the teacher know we were going to the store. We got permission. Mm hmm. And about how long did those recesses last normally just? Oh, uh, the noontime, I think, what, was it a half hour, something like that? Morning recess, 15, 20 minutes, because we shoot marbles in the morning. Mm -hmm. That was our game in the morning. We, of course, you know, you had some champions around at that time with the marbles. You don't see that anymore today. Now, that's something boys would do at recess. Yeah. Being a girl, that's <laughs> not something girls would do at recess. What would you do at recess, Phyllis? I guess I play ball most of the time because I like ball. Dropping handkerchief. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're going to do, but yeah. dropping handkerchief. Can you explain that, what, uh, what dropping handkerchief is? <laughs> we did that at recess. 
So what's the game? What's that game? How do you play You have that? a handkerchief and you run around, you drop it behind a person. That person would run and try to catch up with you. Oh, okay. I think so they it's have like a, a circle game. They have yeah. a version yeah. of something yeah. close to that. Today. You remember that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of drop that handkerchief for, for the one that you like as well, for somebody to oh. change it. You know? <laughs> so remember, you had first graders all the way up to seventh graders, so I'm yeah. sure there were some crushes yeah. oh, going yeah. on in those schools. Oh, yeah. Now, did, did you all bring your own lunch to school, or did oh, yeah. the school provide oh, yeah. lunch? Yeah. There was no cafeteria in those days. Mm -hmm. You bought lunches, whatever mama packed for you. That's what you had. Now, I heard one story about bringing your lunch to school, but you also brought a cup, like a folding cup. Oh, did yeah. you have those? Yeah, I had one. Did you lose your lid? No, I never lost my lid. I heard that that's you did that very early in the school year. Your your cup folded up flat and it had a lid, mm -hmm. and you always ended up losing your lid. Mm -hmm. Now why why would you need to have a cup at school? For for drinks, to drink out of to get your water at the well, because we had a uh, well that you had to pump to get your water. And uh, I might add that uh, one thing that wasn't brought up uh, during the winter time, there was somebody always appointed to take care of the stoves in the school one of the larger boys. One of the students? Yeah, we heated by coal. And believe me, when you got to school in the morning, that, that room was coal. She knows about those coal <laughs> souls. Yeah. That now, was, did you ever have to do that? Or oh, yeah. You were appointed? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everybody gets that assignment along the way, the but boys. In the new school, the two-room school, they had oil. Didn't they have oil heaters? Uh, well, eventually, before mm -hmm. we got out of that school, we had oil heaters. Oh, but to start out with, we had coal stoves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. So, uh, how did they grade the students back in that time? What did they use for grades? And it's like A, B, C, D, and F. Mm -hmm. and did they use like tests? Did you get a lot of tests and homework back then? For oh yeah, you always had homework. Mm -hmm. so tell us about some of the homework you would get. Uh, it's too far back for me. Too far remember. back. Can you remember any? Well, you, or? you you get the uh, the teacher will assign you with math questions to do at home, or <clears throat> be able to come in the next morning and give a report on something from the geography or history. Mm -hmm. That would be your home run, homework assignments. Well, I understand that you uh, were on the honor roll. Can you tell us a little bit about the honor roll uh, program that they had at, at the Well, we had to get school? A's and B's to be on, just like it is now you have to have a certain grade mm -hmm. to be on. I understand you made that honor roll quite often then? Or? Oh, yeah. Okay. Nothing else to do but study. <laughs> so we <you> studied. <laughs> study and farm work. Huh? Our next question is from Amanda. I'm Amanda Wayne, and since a lot of our f land was farmland, did any students have to miss school to help out on the farm? Yes, at a certain time of year, they'd have to stay out of school to help do the farming, like planting corn in the spring, plowing. What else did y'all do? Hay, <coughs> we did the hay, wheat, and whatever come up that the, the farmer had to do and needed extra help, we had to be there. Uh, especially uh, filling Salo in the fall of the year. That was a big job. Hog killing time, they needed help with that. All these things the boys had to participate in. And some of these, some of the time you had to actually do this before you went to school early in the morning? Well, you took the, you, you were off for what, what amount of time it took. Whatever it took. Uh, like mm -hmm. It was two day job, three day job, whatever. That you were off for that amount of time mm -hmm. to help get that job done. Did you also spend much time farming before going to school or taking no. time off so that you do Girls that? Girls didn't have, I, <coughs> excuse me, my sister helped milk the cows, but I, ne I never had, I was too young. I was, well, what what were some of the chores maybe then that they gave the girls? Get in wood, have to get that wood in, mm -hmm. feed the chickens. Um, now, how did the school, the school then, how did they, they accept the fact that they knew you were going to be out of school? Did it? She'd give you homework to catch up, you know, you, she always give you homework to catch up. Mm -hmm. But you also mentioned that some of the boys were as big as men. So if, if you missed a lot of school, did it just take you longer than the seven years to get through it everything you needed? Um, so I remember reading in some of the books I studied that they would actually say, you know, how many kids were a year older than their grade level or two mm -hmm. years older or three years older. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they tried to put the children where they needed to be academically as opposed to where it kind of matched their age. That was the impression I got from what I read. 
Uh, you said that you liked to play ball. What were some of the other sports that they had at the school? Well, we didn't have that much room to play, so most of them, they played horseshoes and they played baseball, but we had tennis balls. We didn't have baseballs then, we had tennis balls. We played, so the girls and the boys played together. Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't have been able to play if we had used a hard ball, but we used a tennis ball. So was there any sport that you were pretty good at, or? Mm, well, baseball, I played a lot of baseballs, shot a lot of marbles. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there was another little game we used to play, hide and seek. We used to play that game at school. But we never saw any real sports until we got on to high school. That's where you had baseball, football, and whatever else they had to offer. Did you play any of those sports in high school? Uh, no, I did not, no. Mm -hmm. uh, football was a little rough for me. I stood on the sidelines for that. <laughs> they played a little baseball, that's about it. Let's go to Flores for more questions. Hi, my name's Lauren King, and I wanted to know, did you have any braces? No, I didn't have any braces. We didn't know much about braces then. We just had crooked teeth. Now, did, they, did you go to dentists and get we other health? We went to dentists, oh, yes. Tell us a little bit about some of, some of the other health care they had, you know, for the, for the students at the school. We, we had to be vaccinated. If yes. we hadn't been vaccinated, we had to be vaccinated when we went to school. Mm -hmm. Vaccination on your own, you know. We had to have that as well. Now, when you speak of the dentistry, we had a doctor who came by to school. I think he came once a year. His name was Dr. Morton, and he brought in his chair and everything, set up right at school. And a lot of kids <laughs> were afraid of him, so they wouldn't come while he was there. But I can remember him very well. Mm -hmm. He used to come to the school. He'd spend a few days there at one school, and then he'd move on to another school to do the same work. Yvonne, in some of your research, you ran across some of the, uh, the health certificates that was issued out to students back then. Could you the, tell us a little about that? The students were checked for several different things, for their hearing, their eyesight, their teeth, their general health, and they were awarded certificates depending on how many of those five points that they got. And we did find one article, it was about 1925-1930, where the uh, colored school students, as a percentage, got much more five-point certificates um, than the white schools of the same time. And I understand Mrs. O'Neill got five points. Was that something that you frequently got, or was that every year? I don't know, that's the one I saved, so I don't know how I, I had gotten, you know. And, and, and how often would that. they come in to give you those uh, Nurse examination. Nurse would come in. Nurse would come in once a year, twice a year or so? Or? I don't remember. I can't really remember. But I think I'm it was in the spring. They came near yeah. the end of school term. They would mm -hmm. come in and do that. Okay. Phyllis O'Neill's granddaughter, Amanda, has our next question. Hello, my name is Amanda O'Neill. I'm a third generation floor student and at my school we have lots of cool things I take for granted like computers to research on. What did you think was cool at your school? Well, the things that we thought was cool at our school was a blackboard. We had a blackboard stretched on two of the walls, and we'd have tests. We would uh, have spelling bees, multiplication tables, and arithmetic problems. The teacher would give each class certain days. Of, each class would go up and do their testing. And, and we were excited. Real cool, blackboard, nice. and you'd wash the wall off, and then you'd go back. Boy, they would, we'd really try to be the first one to finish. Mm -hmm. So you uh, did timetables right on the board there? Or oh, you write the timetable. Mm -hmm. you knew. And, and by what grade would you have to know your timetable? All of them did the start. You know, they started out second, third grade. Mm -hmm. Of course, by the time you got to the sixth and seventh grade, you're supposed to know all that, you know. Mm -hmm. But it was really fun to watch them. And you learned a lot by watching the other kids go to, to the blackboard because you've gotten your lesson and you know a lot of their lessons. So it was really good all being in one class because you learn some of these that happen. Some so of the, the younger kids actually benefit from having the, the older kids in class. the classroom mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the cool things that you, you might have gone through at the school? Well, what she was talking about, uh, going to the blackboard and being able to go through uh, your arithmetic or whatever you were doing at the blackboard. But the other thing, I loved it when the teacher said it's time to clean the erasers and the blackboard because we used to have to go outside. There was a big rock down from the school a few hundred yards. We have to go down and beat the uh, 
erasers on this rock to get the, all the chalk dust out of it. And then, of course, uh, we bring in a small pail of water and wash the blackboards. That was a fun thing to do. So tell me, after you uh, graduated from the Florida Color School, where did you go then for, for I education? I went to Washington, Francis Junior High at Armstrong. That's where I graduated from Armstrong. Mm -hmm. Then when I left Armstrong, I went to Martha Washington Vocational School. And then by that time, the war had started and they were hiring in the government. And I went into the government to work. And I worked there 35 years, six months and 19 days. Wow, that's I'm a retired government employee. Mm -hmm. How about yourself, Joe? I know you mentioned going to school in uh, Manassas. Yeah, I went, went to uh, Jenny Dean in Manassas. From there, went to Luther Jackson on Gallows Road in Murrayfield, Virginia. But after leaving uh, Luther Jackson, I uh, took on jobs in the uh, automotive industry, and I've had various jobs throughout the years, you know. And, and what was the curriculum in, in high school when you went to Manassas and, and Luther Jackson? Well, at uh, Manassas was a uh, vocational school. You could learn mechanics there, bricklaying, and uh, carpenter work, I believe it was. And uh, I was in the uh, bricklaying carpenter shop while I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, how about you, fellas? What were some of your subjects? We had uh, uh, um, uh, science, chemistry. I guess, of course, that's the same. I had chemistry, and I had biology, and I had civics. And I had history, United States history. And did and you I go to high math. school for uh, four years? Did you go to high school for four I went years? I junior high first, and then I went on into uh, Armstrong. So a junior I, high would have been like a two-year high yes, school? Yes, eighth, ninth grade. I went in ninth grade and graduated from France, and then I went on to Armstrong. Mm -hmm. graduated from Armstrong. I might okay. add uh, uh, about Jenny Dean. Uh, you know that here again, only one black high school. Kids came from miles around, as far away as Front Royal and farther, and there was two dormitories on the, uh, on the campus. It reminds you of a college. They stayed there all week long, or maybe they stayed all month before they went back home. It, it just wasn't any high schools around. They had to travel at great distance to get an education. That high school actually served the needs of four different counties. And near the end, right before Fairfax County opened Luther Jackson, Fairfax County students had more people there than all the other three counties put together. So there was actual wow. pressure coming from the state of Virginia that Fairfax County really needed to build a high school to serve the needs of the students. So they, they were getting a lot of external pressure to fulfill these needs. So Luther Jackson then was the, the first school in Fairfax County High mm -hmm. School for, for, uh, for people blacks. of color, is that right? Mm -hmm. Many people probably don't know that. That's the Luther Jackson that we know as a middle school today. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But think of how far, even if you lived in Fairfax County, how far you had to come. If you lived mm -hmm. way in the southern part of the county, you yeah, had see, to come up. I up around Herndon area to go down there. Yeah. yeah, Virginia as a whole was really pretty far behind the curve on the high schools. There was no funding for any high school courses until 1907, and that was 86 years after the first high school was put in in Boston. So the whole South was really slow, and when they first started offering high school, it was really just extra courses being taught at the elementary schools that the teachers would, you know, after teaching all the kids what they needed to know in the primary grades, then they would have to develop supplemental courses for the few students that could stay and continue their studies. Just one last question. Through it all, as you think back, did you think you really got a good education at the Florence College School? Did oh, you comment on it? We had good teachers back then, very thorough teachers. Yeah. I agree with what she said. Mm -hmm. yeah. We said that we knew as much um, <coughs> graduating from grade school as the kids graduated from high school. Because <laughs> sometimes. I heard that different. students coming out of Mrs. Stewart's class, if they went to another school, they had to be skipped ahead because they, you know, she was a good teacher and she was very thorough and they would go to another school and they'd know more than the kids at their grade level, so they'd have to get skipped ahead. And Mrs. Stewart was at the school for quite some time, I understand. 42 years or 45 years. 40 plus she years. Wow. She lived right on Route 50. Yeah. And we found records of her actually teaching there under her married name, Miss Hughes. 
-hmm. And then she married and continued to teach. So mm -hmm. we were lucky she got to stay. As we summarize here, we can say yes, there were two separate floor schools as mandated by segregation policies, Fairfax County Public Schools. At the colored floor school, the facilities was less than adequate and there was a great sense of separation. We've heard how this impacted African-American students attending that school. We've also heard that while not always pleasant and surely not always equal, African-American students were afforded the opportunity and achieved a quality education in the Flores community. The separate schools eventually merged into one school known today as Flores Elementary School, formerly accepting African-Americans and other people of color. As we celebrate 125 years of providing quality education to students, let us not forget how this school and community impacted the lives of people like Phyllis Coates O'Neill, Joseph Carpenter, and many other African-American students during the early 20th century. Let us continue working together as a community for years to come to ensure that Flores Elementary School never becomes separated again. We hope you have enjoyed this look at the Flores College School. I want to thank my guests, Yvonne Johnson, Joseph Carpenter, and Phyllis Coates O'Neill for joining me today. Finally, I want to thank all the wonderful students at Flores Elementary School who provided such elegant questions to our panel guests. Thanks for watching.